We're glad to welcome Dr. Helen Lewis, former college professor, a longtime educator, and a campaigner for Jim B. Carmichael in 1946. So it's 1946, Jimmy Carmichael is running against Eugene Talmadge for governor, and you were there. I had just graduated from college, at Georgia State College for Women, where we had gotten really interested in politics. Ellis Arnold had allowed 18-year-olds to vote, and I was one of the first to be able to vote. As a matter of fact, I was able to cast my first vote for Franklin Roosevelt the last time he ran. And so we became very interested in trying to maintain the progressive uh, government that Ellis Arnold had produced. And since he could not succeed himself and had selected Carmichael, we became big Carmichael supporters in the college. And we formed a League of Women Voters, one of the first of young people, young women students. But we also formed something called the Student League for Good Government. And that was sort of, I think, throughout the state. I know the University of Georgia had a Student League for Good Government. And so when the campaign started, they asked me and George Doss from the University of Georgia to come and be in the campaign headquarters and organize students for Carmichael. And so we did. We lived in the campaign uh, um, headquarters at the Piedmont Hotel all summer and had an office called the Student League for Good Government. And we organized students all over the state of Georgia. We had students in every county. We had them in giving out sound trucks. We had some, uh, Alan Colley, who was from Grantville, whose mother ran the women's campaign for Carmichael. He was running around in a sound truck. He also flew an airplane and dropped leaflets in some places. Um, we had students uh, writing radio spots and doing those letters to the editor, making speeches at Kiwanis clubs and anywhere that they were allowed to. But we had students organized, I think, in every county of Georgia. Well, in the headquarters, they thought we were kind of a joke and we were called the Children's Crusade. And so there was a lot of joking with us as, and a lot of students hanging out there all the time. It was a very lively place and a very exciting summer. We were so sure we were going to win. And actually we did bring in, I think, we always said 100,000 extra votes into that campaign, more so than any campaign prior to that had ever had voted in Georgia. And so we, we took full credit for all of that, which probably wasn't exactly true. But anyway, that's how I was there. And um, um, we were very excited. We were so sure we were beating both Rivers and, because uh, Ed Rivers was running, as well as um, Herman, um, as um, Eugene Talmadge. And the night of the, of the election, we were just, you know, exuberant. We were so sure we were winning. We went over and to the, visited the Rivers headquarters and talked about didn't he look natural <laughs> and, uh -huh. and, and uh, treated it like it was a, a, a big funeral. And so we were just, uh, and then when the county unit votes came in and we had lost the election, it was a very, very sad place, as you can imagine. So it was, um, a really important time for me because I had just graduated from college and I was going to graduate school that fall. So I left the um, state and went to Duke University that fall. So I missed all the excitement when uh, Talmadge died and Herman claimed the office and you had we had three governors and so I was very I just wanted to be back <laughs> because I it convinced me that I wanted to go into politics. Well, did so, you have a political career after that? Well, not really. I, uh, my idea at that particular time was I was going to 
go to, I'd already been accepted at Duke and I was going to go to Duke for a year and then I was going to come back and, and buy a county use, a newspaper. And some of the people in the Democratic Party were all in favor of that and were going to help me do that. And then I would get into politics. So I was all determined to, to get into politics. Instead, I go to Duke. It's right after World War II, veterans coming in. I'd been at a woman's college <laughs> for four years. And so what did I do is get married to a Virginian, ended up at the University of Virginia. And, um, but I did come back after the year at, um, at Duke and work for um, Melvin Thompson. They called me after the court had decided that, that Thompson was the legal governor. And I had made friends with DeWitt Roberts. And DeWitt Roberts was the sort of public relations ghost writer. He was called the, the real ghost for uh, Ellis Arnold's books. As a matter of fact, I helped him do some research for The Shore Dimly Scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he just insisted I come back and work with the um, Thompson um, as governor and be one of the ghost writers. So I worked there for the year uh, after from uh, 47 uh, and we had a house across the street from the Capitol which Herman Talmadge called the haunted house <laughs> and I think in one of his big editorials I was named as the the littlest ghost or the smallest ghost or something in the and one of the things that I did was well answer a lot of letters you know mm -hmm. the governor gets a whole lot of uh, requests for information about certain things about departments or what's going on in this so I just I answered letters he was doing a sort of a weekly uh, sort of fireside chat kind of thing I wrote some of those speeches mm -hmm. and um, other speeches when he, I remember DeWitt Roberts had me write one he was giving to a, a fraternity here at the University of Georgia and it was supposed to be glorifying the Old South. Well, I was pretty much an activist and a radical in those days and, and this was sort of a joke that I was going to have to write something supporting the glory of the old Confederacy or something which was not, not the sort of thing I wanted to, to write. So. Uh, I did that. Also, one of the things I did was one of the legislators had a son in college who needed a term paper on the prison system. <laughs> so I wrote a research paper for him um, on the history of the prison system in Georgia. So those were the kind of jobs that I had in the haunted house. And I stayed there until June of forty. Eight, I guess. And that summer, I, uh, my, I'd married. I had married in that fall of 47. So that while I was working there, I was married. And we were living in a trailer out at Emory University on the campus for veterans who had come back from the war and who were, he, because what happened was my husband, who was a graduate student at Duke with me. When I came back to Georgia, he came and enrolled at Emory. And we married, and I lived in this trailer in the middle of the campus between the post office and the, the cafeteria. So it was one of those little trailers that didn't even have a bathroom in it. And you had to sort of go up the, the walkway to a to a, a big trailer which had all the bathrooms and here were all these wives and children and, and <laughs> people running up the, as, the, as the students were going between the post office and the cafeteria and I wondered how many young men decided never to get married <laughs> based on seeing how we were living in this little slum in the middle of Emory University. So okay that's another story but anyway that's uh, where I was uh, living. So that summer I I got asked to work with the YWCA office in, uh, in Atlanta 
and I had been very active in the YWCA at Georgia State College for Women, and we had been actively involved in what I call the early civil rights movement, because we were going to integrated meetings and things like that. So I was very interested in the YWCA, so I worked in that office that summer. And that's another story that I'll tell you later, if you would like, about how a group of us got arrested and made the front page of the Atlanta Constitution for mixed dance, but that's another story. Let's get back to uh, the election in 1946. Okay. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Mr. Carmichael received more votes statewide than Governor Talmadge, but he was defeated by the, the county unit system. What was his reaction to that? Well, we were all just devastated. I mean, and at that time, I think that stirred up the whole movement against the the um, um, uh, county unit system. And then James Mackey, who was at Emory, who uh, began to lead a real campaign against that. And all of us were really, you know, I mean, it was a sad place that evening in our headquarters. <laughs> And a lot of people came by, and everybody was, you know, just sort of devastated because we had done, we thought, such a good job, and we had brought in the votes, and and um, it was um, so. I don't remember any personal reactions that he had. I mean, I just remember the whole sense of of distress on the part of everybody who was there. Um, um, he was in and out of the campaign office, and as a matter of fact, I had a, a room in the, uh, the Piedmont Hotel, which was also used during the day for anybody who was there, including, including Jimmy Carmichael, who would be need to change clothes or dress or take a shower or shave. And so I was oftentimes going back to my room and finding uh, Jimmy Carmichael's clothes. <laughs> and this got to be quite a joke uh, with other students who would come and, and, and visit and, and they'd say, uh-oh, what's going on here? What is your role in this campaign? But um, uh, he, he was not, uh, I mean, we were so busy, you know, organizing the students and keeping all of that going that there was not a lot of interaction with him. So in that sense, I'm not uh, that clear on, I don't think he hung around the office a lot that night. I think he um, probably went home to his family. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So that's not Do you something. recall uh, what uh, part, if any, uh, Governor Arnold played in that race? No, he must have done some campaigning, but um, um, I don't know. And um, and I never saw him much either. That race was typical of Georgia's uh, two-party system at the time. You had the, the Ed Rivers mm -hmm. group, mm -hmm. uh, which included Governor Arnold and Mr. Thompson, and then you had the Talmages, who had prevailed for at least 20 years mm -hmm. prior to that election. Uh, did Carmichael have any real interest in politics after that election? Not that I know of, because I was away then the next year at Duke, and then I was back for a year in the, the um, in the office, you know, working for Thompson. And I don't remember him ever showing up or hanging out or anything. I think he just disappeared, mm -hmm. went back home. Um, and so it was a, we of course was in the ha haunted house, which was this house across the way. And it was more like a press room. Mm -hmm. There were reporters in and out of there. They came to us for information. Um, um, the Atlanta Constitution, uh, Ken T Turner, was it his name, Ken? Ken Turner, yes. Yeah, he would sh show up and check with what was going on with DeWitt Roberts and all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it was um, so we uh, uh, there was things going on. I think this was the time when they bought Jekyll Island. There was a lot of that going on uh, at the time. Um, so I don't think Carmichael, hung, you know, had any relationship. Uh, now, if he did over in the Capitol, that was mm -hmm. kind of across the road, mm -hmm. and we would maybe go over to the office to pick up mail and get our assignments and that sort of thing, but that was our main responsibility. Um, and after that, I don't know that uh, the, I don't think the Student League for Good Government even continued on, on college campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it was a, such a state of depression and such a, a state of repression because um, up until that time, there had been a, a sort of a safe period, I felt called, call it, in Georgia under Ellis Arnold. And we were still going to integrated conferences at Atlanta University, Payne College in Augusta. Uh, the YWCA was very active in opposing segregation, but there had been crosses burned on the campus at GSEW. The woman who headed up this organization for the preservation of white women said that GSEW and Agnes Scott were communist schools because students were going to integrated meetings. So there was a lot of, of sort of activism going on in the 30s and the 40s. By the middle of the 40s, there was this, as I say, safe period, but Guy Wells, who was the president of GSCW, came to the YWCA and said, I want you to keep doing these integrated meetings, but don't tell me. So what happened was all of that, all the activism went underground. And I think, and that continued into that summer of 48 when I was there. These things were secret, you know, and they were not recorded. I mean, you can go to the college newspaper now and look at all the 40s. There's never a mention of any of those conferences or any of those things that were going on. In the 30s, it was very open and in the newspapers. Uh, by that time, it had gone underground, and by the 50s, the Y had just sort of gone out of business <laughs> almost. It became just Bible study and devotions and all of the really activism. I mean, when I was there, we had Clarence Jordan coming and speaking. We had Frank McAllister coming and Tell speaking. Tell us who Clarence Jordan is. Clarence Jordan was the, a Baptist preacher who had bought this land down in South Georgia and started an integrated farm. And he was harassed and, and um, by the Ku Klux Klan. People in America wouldn't even sell him seeds, that he would run out of the Baptist church. Uh, it, they, it was a dangerous place there. But he continued and developed this koinonia, which, from which Habitat for Humanity developed and grew. And it still exists as a, as a communal farm uh, with, uh, and they sell pecans and fruitcakes and things like that, and, and um, still have, um, a, an ongoing operation. He died, and after that, it was not as active as it was before. But it is still a business and still a um, a cooperative farm. And and Jimmy Carter even went there and, as a student, I think, and did a little work. And I mean, it now has a good reputation. But in the early days, it was like. Uh, something that to be destroyed. It was something of a scourge on the good old South, you know. And so anyway, those people came and talked. Lucy Randolph Mason um, was a really impressive, wonderful woman, a labor organizer. So those were the things that were happening. By the 50s, all of that was gone. And the college no longer gave financial support to the Y, and they encouraged the denominations, the religious denominations, to take over. And so the whole activism, by 1960, um, a student got suspended and 
and had to leave the college because she attended black conference in Payne and also went to black churches. So all the sort of student activism left the campuses and became part of SNCC and SOC and all of those other uh, um, organizations. So if you wanted to be an activist then you couldn't do it through the college as you did in the 30s and 40s and 20s even. There were interracial meetings in the 20s and a lot of sort of activism on the part of in women's southern women's colleges. When I tell that story to people that that I was doing all this stuff in the 40s, they that there was early civil rights movement. They say, oh no, that didn't start then. It started after 54. Or it started in the 60s. But that was happening at that particular time. And so, um, but. After Arnold and when Talmadge came back, the segregationists really put such pressure on the colleges that they were afraid to do anything. And they soon got rid of Guy Wells, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he ended up working with the Southern Regional Council and, and supporting and uh, working for the integration of the schools. And so it was a pretty um, interesting period of time. And, and looking back in history, uh, what do you think was the turning point in people of Georgia accepting racial integration as a way of life? I guess when Eisenhower sent the troops <laughs> and to Little Rock, uh, when there was a real and Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. I mean, it, it became clear that there was going to be a lot of pressure. I was in Virginia at that time, teaching in a branch college at the University of Virginia. And Prince Edward County and the Virginia schools, you know, uh, uh, refused to integrate. and and. And there were schools all over, and of course, that was the beginning of all these little private Christian schools, so that people could go, uh, not go to the integrated schools. But it, um, there's still a lot of racism, and there's still a lot of people homeschooling and sending kids to private schools, still in the South, but. There's a whole lot more acceptance, and and I think that's why young people do not. Some of the young younger people who've grown up in integrated schools don't have some of those phobias and problems that some of the older people in the in their their parents or their grandparents had. Mm -hmm. As incredible changes, really, in terms of the amount of fear that we would fa have. I remember spending a, a week, when in the, in back in the 40s, 44 I guess, I went, spent a weekend in the dormitory at Spelman, living with black students and eating in the cafeteria with black students. And that was, you know, like the first time I'd ever been in a social relationship with black people, you know, and you couldn't go out and eat together in public. And that was the same time when we all got arrested. I, I mean, a little later, it was 48 uh, when we got arrested in Atlanta and I was working with the YWCA. But anyway, I remember going to the, eating in the cafeteria and sitting by this in, with black women and one of them got up and left who was sitting next to me. And the other woman on the other side said, oh, I'm real sorry, but you know, she's prejudiced against white people. And I, it just shocked me because I thought, I'm supposed to be the one that's prejudiced. I didn't, didn't know prejudice acted both ways. So it was, all of these were real eye-opening experiences, which was sponsored through the YWCA, which was one of the very earliest of these sort of, um, um, Act, you know, early civil rights activities. Mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you about that summer of 48, if you don't mind. Do you want to hear that? Sure. Okay. I was, had been working in um, the haunted house, and I was getting ready to, to 
leave and go to Virginia. So I took the job that summer. They needed somebody in the YWCA regional office, which was located, I think, on Lucky Street. It was, and it was a building which had next to it the C CIO offices, and they had a sort of a training center there where they were training union organizers. And we were next door. And so a group of seminarians came to Atlanta to do sort of um, uh, work with poor people and help build houses or ramps or uh, so forth. And there were two blacks in the group and the rest, uh, they were from Vanderbilt, Yale, different colleges and seminaries. And, and they were sponsored by the, the um, um, interracial commission of Atlanta, I think, and they were living on the the black campus the, at Atlanta University, and but they asked the YWCA if they would have a little reception for them. So we asked the CIO if we could use their little training room next door, and so we had a reception for them. and And I was there in the office, so I invited all the YWCA. Uh, women from GSCW who went in Atlanta that summer. Some had just graduated uh, and had jobs. One was working with the um, um, uh, Red Cross, I think, or, or the um, um, Girl Scouts. It was the Girl Scouts. Others had jobs and others were just home for the summer. So we had a group come in and, and we were having a little reception and we were doing some little dance like the, you know, a little get together thing like the Virginia Reel. And the police come in <laughs> and, and just say, oh, keep on, go keep on doing what you're doing. And we looked at them and they, then they had us all sit down and they called us out individually and said, what would your daddy think if he saw you dancing with a black man? Or oh, they used the N word, of course. And so, I mean, it, it, so individually they did the, that. Each one of us gave us a ticket for disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, and then told us to go home and come to court later. So we, they didn't take us to jail. And there was a, some preachers there and their wives. There was another cu black couple. So there, I think there were at least three black people and 18 white people, something like that it was the um, numbers. And so we went home. The next morning on the front page of the Constitution was mixed dance and listed everybody's names and addresses. So I mean, the, I had to call my father up and come in Georgia and I said, look at the paper and go explain to your neighbors <laughs> what's going on. And so. Luckily, he said, well, I'm proud of you, but because um, he had been a, a pretty liberal anti-Talmage person for years, and the, um, but other s students and other people, some of the girls lost their jobs, some of them lost their, got run out of their apartments, parents were really upset and you know wrote all sorts of letters back and forth and telegrams to the to the to their daughters about you know what do you mean being in a mixed dance and that sort of stuff well it appeared then again in the sunday papers it appeared in the journal and the constitution which were two separate ones and then of course herman got it, it got hold of it so when we were supposed to go to court the clan was out and so uh, we got James Mackey from Emory as our lawyer, and I have a, a piece, he wrote up a piece describing what happened and um, for everybody's family and for everybody to know. And there was a lot of complaints to, to Ralph McGill and everybody for doing that. And it was kind of a mistake. The police had been watching that place because they had integrated training sessions with the CIO, so they wanted to catch a CIO training session, and instead they caught this bunch of YWCA girls and, and preachers, you know. And so it was a little embarrassing, but it was a, a very, I mean, uh, a, 
a shocking experience for all of us. Finally, we all, he, Mackie got the charge dropped to disorderly conduct. Uh, I got that and it's just disturbing the peace. Mm -hmm. And we all paid $25, except for two or three people who lived in Atlanta and agreed, decided to go ahead and fight it through. But the rest of us had going back to school uh, or had things to do. I was moving to Virginia and so we paid our $25 and that was the end of it. But who, was, who was mayor back then? Do you remember? Was it Mr. Hartsfield? Might have been. I'm not, this would be 48. I'm not, I'm not sure. But um, we should have, and I'm, I imagine the people who lived here and continued to probably made their complaints to the mayor. But the um, rest of us just <laughs> went our way and, and uh, got out of it. But that was, and so the whole, I mean, there was this sort of open period, I think, when Ellis Arnold was there. There was, well, because he did not fight against the primaries being integrated. He did not fight against the uh, transportation that was integrated during that period. There were a lot of little changes that happened. And he was urged to, you know, try to fight against it, and he didn't. He, it was open. And then he allowed 18-year-olds to vote, and that's how we got involved in politics, and we were the first state to do that. And so I feel real proud that I was one of the first 18-year-olds that got to vote. Well, by the time I was in the campaign, I was 20, 21, I guess, at that point. But I was still pretty young and sort of idealistic, and, and it was right after the war, and we were going to have peace and never have war again. And, I know one student and I were going around at, making speeches at Kiwanis about the United Nations and how important that was. And so it was like, a, we thought, you know, the New South was with us until segregationists came back and, and um, put such pressure on the schools. So that the schools have never, uh, well, the activism, students became active, but they were active without the cooperation of the administration. as Because Guy Wells was a pretty remarkable president of that college. So anyway, that's where we are. Let me ask you a question about, again, about Carmichael. Uh, I have here a statement that, uh, that he made at, uh, speaking to students at uh, Emory University in 1950 in which he told the audience, I sicken of these people who are always waving the Confederate flag and telling us what a glorious heritage the South has. No one denies this heritage, but too many of our people want to keep on living on who they are and where they came from. And he encouraged Georgians to embrace change. And uh, my question about Carmichael is, if he had been elected, do you think he would have taken steps toward racial harmony in Georgia? I think he would have tried. I mean, I think, you know, he was still up against a, a sort of a strong, powerful group of people in Herman and, and, and that crowd. I mean, Herman's little uh, newspaper, the Statesman, New Statesman, was, was just on everybody's case. And so there was, and there was, but I do think, like Ellis Arnold, it would, he could have, he would have continued that more a safer period for other groups to be active and do stuff. He might not have been able to do as much with his legislature as he would have wanted to do, but I think he would have made a, a period where. Um, and I believe, yeah, well, they did, of course, get rid of the county unit system. And that was, so there were, uh, there were progressive things happening in Georgia, but it was harder. It was much, much harder. And you had, you know, Lester Maddox and the whole crowd, you know, in power. Th there is a limit to what, you know, colleges can do because they're going to lose their money. And, and uh, colleges were, I mean, I know, 
during the 30s, a group of YWCA girls at GSCW went to Fort Valley and had a day talking to black students and faculty. The word got out that they had uh, caroused and had an orgy with black male students. And this was uh, this woman who headed up, I've forgotten her name, do you remember the name of the woman who headed up that uh, Society for the uh, uh, Protection of White Women? She called Talmadge and, and um, sent letters to the, all of the legislature about this affair. And Guy Wells had to fire the YWCA secretary named Polly Moss. They claimed that she had Negro blood because otherwise there would be no way in which she would have allowed those students to go down to Fort Valley. Well, it was at that point that she, that Talmadge, you know, when he got this, the whole school system um, discredited, you know, he required Guy Wells to get rid of the accountant firm because they were, they were progressive Democrats and had been working with the Y in taking students to interracial meetings and made them fire another teacher and hire this woman who was a real segregationist. And the only way he was going to get any money was at that time. So, so having a segregationist or strong segregationist in power meant that the colleges and universities and, well, all people who were relying on, on state funding to toe the ground, you know. So I, it, it would have made a big difference. It would, could have made a big difference in the activity of students and in the type of teaching that you got. I know that the faculty got really, really scared. Um, I've read some things of the YWCA kind of went underground as well as in the 50s and they formed, their conferences were no longer called interracial conferences, they were called human relations conferences. And they, Ella Baker, Casey Hayden, Mary King were all on the payroll of the YWCA as they were helping SNCC or get organized, and they were doing these interracial conferences still and calling them human relations conferences. And they would offer to go to a college. The YWCA's were, and many of these colleges were no longer um, being supported by the college, but they would call people in the sociology department or political science department and suggest that they come and that they would talk, do a lecture on human relations. <laughs> And they were able to get into the colleges under the th that, under human relations rather than the YWCA. So, I mean, it, it, there was a whole lot of underground work that was going on, but it was hard to do, and much harder to do in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And the black colleges were more open, of course, and the private colleges were more open, but the state colleges pretty much, um, I mean, I, you know, suspended students. They were careful not to let things be written, editorials for, for immigration. There was one woman at Auburn um, who's a novelist now. I read in the paper the other day that she got, suspe she got suspended because she wrote an editorial for integration in, in Auburn. University, and she, uh, um, it's Seton, her name is Seton, she has a new book out, and they were doing book signings lately. She wrote the book on Peachtree Street and all of those, so she. Ann Rivers. Ann, yeah, Ann Rivers Seton. She got, she got suspended from Auburn for writing, she, with the, in the college newspaper, about a, a pro-integration. So it was, the colleges clamped down. Atlanta's business establishment supported Ellis Arnold in his race against Eugene Talmadge in uh, 1942. 
and Mr. Carmichael again in 1946. But they never surfaced again until Carl Sanders ran in 1962. Some people give Sanders the credit for being a New South governor because of his moderation on racial issues and his progressive program for Georgia. Uh, what was the civil rights movement at that time? Well, by then I was, um, um, what, was his, what was his date? He was elected in 1962. 1962, I was then living in the coal fields of Virginia and it was kind of like I disappeared from the civil rights movement. I'd been active in, in those early days at GSEW. By the time I got to the University of Virginia uh, in 48, uh, the first black student came into the law school there, and he and I were on panels together and talked about stuff. But then I ended up teaching way out in the coal fields and the issues there was strip mining, black lung disease, um, uh, uh, union reform. And so my students and I got very much involved and I got very much involved in the United Mine Workers and, and all of the problems of the, there. And so the civil rights movement just kind of passed me by. I would read about it in the paper. I'd read about Selma and say, oh my gosh, if I had been stayed in Georgia, I would be there, you know. I would be involved. I would have been involved probably in the sit-ins in Atlanta and stuff like that. But I was not, um, um, I was not there. I was involved. And, and got in trouble, actually, as a teacher and with my students in some of the protests against strip mining and, and uh, uh, working with community groups and activist groups in the mountains. So, so I left the civil rights. And so when I came back to Georgia, I, had, I was out of Georgia for 50 years. So I moved back to Georgia 10 years ago, and it's kind of like the politics are something I don't even understand anymore. I mean, it's, it is another world. I mean, we had no Republicans when I was here. Uh, now, I mean, we had the conservatives and the liberal Democrats, and, and, it's, and so it's probably better that they call themselves what they are now instead of uh, pretending to be Democrats when they weren't. So it's like... Um, to, it's, um, I've had a hard time relearning Georgia politics. And it was, it's sort of sad because that was going to be my life at one time. Mm -hmm. But then marriage and, and becoming a college professor, teaching sociology and anthropology, and being in the coal fields for 40 years mm -hmm. really got me involved in the Virginia politics. And then, and but only on sort of that and Appalachian studies I started one of the first courses in Appalachian studies and been very much involved in Appalachian regional kinds of issues and particularly around mining and so I lost I was no longer involved in the in the sort of real southern civil rights movement but I, I followed it in the newspaper but that's all so, so the Georgia politics, I dis disappeared from my life. So. You hear a lot of criticism of federal programs nowadays. Uh, what uh, effect do you think the uh, Appalachian Commission has had on Appalachia? It's modernized a lot of stuff, but it also, it opened it up with big roads. I, I was always critical of it, um, as a matter of fact. When Jimmy Carter came in as president, I was on his list to be the uh, director of the Appalachian Regional Commission. There was no way I would have been selected because I had been fairly critical of the Appalachian Regional Commission for putting their money into such, uh, not really doing anything. For instance, land reform was one of the biggest problems in the mountains. When you have 80% of the land and minerals owned by coal companies, there's no way that those counties can really, you know, make big changes. They don't have the resources. So you can put in big roads, it helps people get out, 
but the mechanization of the mines, the consolidation of the mines, the, uh, the lack of safety in the mines, well, such big, big problems. And, and, and what happened was the coal companies kind of co-opted the politics in, the, in those states and in those um, counties. And it was just, um, so they did not, we had to force, I was with a group that forced the Appalachian Regional Commission to do a land study on land and minerals. They had never even done a study which said how much land and how much minerals we even owned or do anything about the tax structure. There was no severance tax on coal when I got up there. And I started with some of my students and people in town and some of the little local coal miners, uh, operators, joined in trying to get a severance tax on coal. The small operators were told by the big companies where they had to sell their coal, get out of that. And it took several years, but eventually there was a severance tax on coal and now all those states have it. So, but there was, it was, um, they, okay, they have done some good stuff. They built some schools, they did some water systems, and um, I used to go with groups, and they've done some good stuff with education, but I, they did, have not gotten to some of the root causes. Maybe they never would or could, but so I've been sort of a semi, I, would, I wouldn't vote to do away with it. <laughs> But I also would like them to be more involved in sustainable uh, grassroots community development. What did you think of Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty? It was helpful. It was really helpful. It was good. Uh, I guess they lost the war. <laughs> but there's, um, there's still a lot of poverty because nobody's dealing with the root causes. And so you have continuing problems of poverty, out-migration. Um, I don't see, you know, maybe, I mean, right now the mountain top removal type of mining and the real push now for more coal and using more coal in our energy uh, crisis is is absolutely devastating what's left of the mountains and what's so sad is it's going to affect it's affecting the water resources for the whole eastern seaboard cuz they're covering up rivers and covering up streams with all that overburden and uh, water tables are dropping i mean this is not the way this is not sustainable. There's never, it's not at all sustainable. So, uh, what do you think are the root causes of poverty? Is it education, as most people think? It's the great division between the rich and the poor, which is the greatest we've ever had and the tax system, which favors corporate businesses. I mean, we need land reform in many places, too. And, and we need, uh, I guess that's why I'm an Obama supporter. I don't think even there he will be able to do all that needs to be done. But this sort of, um, the way in which corporate capitalism has, has taken over without any sort of criticism of it. You know, the market is going to solve it all. It is not. We've got to have more regulation. We've got to have a greater distribution of the wealth. And we've got to put some resources in the hands of rural communities. And rural policies and agribusiness policies have got to be changed. We've got to go back to more regional agriculture, and, re and it's there's just a whole lot of structural changes I think that need to be made. I mean, the, co the economy is not a moral economy. 
And so that that's it, I think, is that distribution of wealth. So we need some jubilees. If you're asked to give advice to a young student at, uh, G well, it's Georgia College and State University now, uh, who is interested in becoming involved in politics, what would you say to them? I'd say do it. I mean, you, they need to participate. They need to not just vote, but they need to really get involved. And as 18-year-olds, they can, you know. Um, I, when I did the inaugural lecture for the new president down there, and what I did was talk about the 40s and the kind of civic education we got, the kind of participation in uh, trying to develop integration, uh, and I, I just said they need to go back to having more civic education, more political education, and more participation in politics by young people. I, th I don't think the League of Women Voters still exists down there, because it's now co-ed school, and um, the YWCA hardly exists. Um, and, and there's no other organization pushing. The denominations don't push it. The social gospel is kind of dead. And so um, I would like to see, I think it's happening. And some of it is happening through service learning. Students have been re asking for more responsibility to the communities where they live and to the communities they come from. And they go and work with, you know, poor or with communities, and sort of that has sort of brought forth a group of students now that are pushing to be more activists. So I see movement in in some of the colleges, and so it's time the administration got on board and and made this more possible, and because those were the experiences that educated me more than, than a lot of the classes. Mm -hmm. It was those extra, I went, <laughs> in 1945, I took a bus from Atlanta, Georgia to Hartford, Connecticut. Three day journey. Um, and worked, I was with a YWCA project called Student in Industry. We all had to go out, we lived in a co-op house, it was interracial. There was a young Japanese there who had come out of the concentration camps. There was a black student from Harvard whose parents were afraid for him to even come to that summer project because there were two young girls from Georgia going to be their white girls and they were afraid that they would mistreat their son. Mm -hmm. uh, but we became really good friends. We all had to get jobs and at night we had seminars on labor and industry. I mean, that was an incredible education. I worked in a place that made the Norton bomb site, and they put me on as an expediter to run around the, the factory to put things together to make things produced. But they did it mostly as a joke, because I spoke with a, such a southern accent mm -hmm. that they thought it would amuse the workers. Mm -hmm. So that was my job for the summer until they discovered that I had worked in the library and they put me then in a, in a room with all the patents to develop a library system for all of their papers and things. So, so they finally put me to work at a decent job. But that summer was an incredible education. And so I think through service learning at colleges today that, that, that students are beginning to participate more. And, so my advice is to, to get involved in politics. It's pretty important. Well, you certainly have, and you've had a wonderful career. And, and I want to so thank you on behalf of the Richard Russell Library and the University of Georgia for being with us. I'm pleased to have been asked. Thank you for letting me tell some of my story. Anything right. else you want to say? I don't think so. I've, you may want to read this 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 thing that I wrote about the about the. Um, well, you have a copy here. That's mine. He'll yes. give you a copy, but oh, okay. you need a copy of that because it's really gives you a lot of names of everybody in the. Um, um,
you know, one who of my, were involved in this this project in that in the Carmichael campaign headquarters. I think this one of my great helpful. heroes in this life has been a fellow named Walter Brooks. I don't. I guess you won't remember Walter Brooks. He was associated with uh, Senator Talmadge, Governor Talmadge, okay. Senator Talmadge, and he was uh, he was my mentor uh, as a speechwriter, and he had. He had the most respect for DeWitt, DeWitt Roberts, you'd never believe. DeWitt Roberts was his hero. Well, DeWitt was, was a great friend of mine. He, he was so upset that I went on to Duke. He wanted me to stay and be part of that. They had my whole life planned. DeWitt had, had my life planned. He, uh, Alan Colley, whose mother was uh, the head of the women's campaign, and they were big politicians and came out of a mill owning families in Grantville. He was at that meeting when we all got arrested. And he and I were kind of boyfriends that summer. Uh, and um, we, um, uh, I mean, they had the idea that he was going to be governor and I was going to marry Alan and that we were going to be the first family of Georgia. That was, that was the scheme. <laughs> well, I said, that, you know, that he had just graduated from Princeton and he was kind of a, a Kennedy sort of person. He got killed that, that next summer. He was a pilot and he was with the National Guard and there was a crash and he died. And so that ruined that <laughs> little episode. Besides that, I had gone to Duke and had met someone and, and so that romance was gone, wasn't much of a romance, it was just kind of a little flirtation. Mm -hmm. And it, um, so, but there was, DeWitt had it all planned and then he had it planned that I would buy this county newspaper. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, Amelia Nodler, was running a newspaper in the county. She was for a GSCW student. Mm -hmm. And so then I would run for the legislature Mm -hmm. So uh, they had it all my life planned, which was, <laughs> and I was excited about it until I changed my <laughs> changed my plans and became a college professor instead. But I've always was as a teacher. I must say that I was all more of an organizer of students than mm -hmm. I was the the proper lecturer. Mm -hmm. I got them involved in grassroots groups, involved in United Mine Workers, and and. Uh, and black, but this this was the, their family's problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, the students started Virginia Citizens for Better Reclamation. As a result, I got fired, and it was for nurturing radical students. Oh, being oh. said, so so I must say that I was politically involved with my students in all these social movements in the mountains, and that to me was. I, I told the dean, well, I thought that was what teaching was all about, yeah. was nurturing radical students. But anyway, so it was, so I continued to be active and active politically wherever I was, but um, which made it difficult, I mean, somewhat difficult, you know, in terms of, you know, Did you the know administration. Did you Wilder? Knew, I mean, I didn't know him personally, but very excited, yeah. I know who he was. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah. Great, yeah. yeah. When he ran for governor, well, he was lieutenant governor. Yeah. When he ran for governor, I helped host a series of fundraisers for him. Oh, did you? Good for you. In the city of Atlanta. All right. Good. And he was, yeah. uh, he was elected and then re-elected. Mm-hmm. Very nice guy. Can I ask a question while the camera's still rolling? Because I just, I didn't turn oh, it off. Oh, you didn't turn yeah. it off. Uh-oh. <laughs> <Just, laughs> yeah. I want to ask one more question. And Bob, mm -hmm. you can chime in on this too, but what impact uh, do you think World War II had and the end of the war have on the election in 46 for governor, or was there an impact? Because Ellis Arnold was obviously elected as the war was beginning for the United mm -hmm. States and uh, taking this more progressive path, and then with the close of the war, did that have an impact on what happened in 46? I don't know. Um. I think it was more the sort of be the beginning civil rights and that sort of beginning to integrate facilities and things that really produced more fear on part of people uh, that 
influenced it more because actually there was sort of a euphoria at the end of the war. I mean, you know, about peace and prosperity and and that should have helped more than 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 hinder. Um, and he did win the popular vote. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, so, the problem, you know, the problem then was the county unit system. Yeah. When you take uh, when you take three small counties with a population of thirty thousand, can equal the vote of Fulton County, which has a population of four hundred thousand. There's no way in the world you go a pop, you know, winning the popular vote is going to get you elected. You got to run those in those counties. You got to have county mm. organizations. You got to have the sheriffs and the county commissioners and all those people out there turning out the vote for you. And that's why the, the machine in Georgia was so powerful. It's, it started with, uh, with Eugene Talmadge in 1926 when he ran for agriculture commissioner and extended through uh, 1962 when the county unit system was abolished uh, and the county unit system elected all the governors between that period, and therefore you, you you didn't get candidates running because they feared losing because they couldn't win out in the out in the Eustings. He was an incredible speaker too. I mean, I went to one of those big rallies, and the first thing he'd do is get up on the stage, and it was an outdoor stage, and he had people up in the trees that were going to yell to him, and he would, you know, they'd say, "Take off your coat, Gene." Red suspenders. Yeah. Tell us about your son Herman. Herman's fitting the war. And then he did this whole thing about the farmer has, you know, three friends, Sears Roebuck, God Almighty, and Gene Talmadge, you know. And he was incredible. I mean, it was just a show. It was a wonderful show. And he was just that real populist leader among, he had bragged that he never carried a county with a streetcar in it. You know, all didn't those. Want to carry a yeah, didn't want to carry. And he could jump on the media and all this media against him, and that just proved to be fine. Well, when I got to the coal fields, it was kind of like the uh, coal companies had the same kind of control over local politicians in the coal fields that Talmadge and his gang had over the pine tree uh, counties. You know, it you know, was if like, they if they gave Oscars. To politicians for acting, Eugene Talmadge would have a mantle full. Oh, wouldn't he? Because though? he, do you know, he was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Georgia. Brilliant man. Smart as a whip. Played. He was a 135-pound lineman on the Georgia football team. He was an accomplished boxer, but you would think that he was just an old dirt farmer from Telfair County. Mm -hmm. And he had people convinced of that, and they never, never saw through mm -hmm. his acting ability. Well, my family were always anti Talmans. My father was a rural mail carrier. He almost got fired once, I think, when, I think maybe it was when um, Ellis Arnold got elected. <laughs> he, he put aspirins in the mailbox of <laughs> this man he'd argued politics with, a big Talmud supporter. Well, he got reported, and he almost got fired from carrying the mail because he had done this, put this aspirin in this mailbox. And uh, so, so I grew up pretty strong anti-Talmud, but I must say I admired the old man for his acting ability and his, I mean, he was incredibly entertaining as well, so. Um, what do you think uh, caused all of his uh, demagoguery? <sighs> how you get elected, that's how you get elected. Did he lose to Arnold in 42 because of the, the UGA scandal? And the I think it was, I think yeah. regardless of, you know, poor farmers and wanting the small, you know, cheap tags and all that sort of stuff and the feeling that he was on their side, they still believed in education and they wanted their kids to get a good education. So I think that whole thing, that allowed Ellis Arnold to get elected. And so if that was the, the main thing, was to get those 
colleges reaccredited so that people's kids would have a decent education. And um, and Arnold had a lot of pluses. In, Arnold had been, you know, Attorney General. He was very well liked. He had uh, he had the legislature behind him, and, and that's important. I was sorry that he never got a real good federal position or or continued in politics or was able to continue in politics. I mean, he just kind of. Um, was not, uh, I mean, they were, he was thought, I mean, I know he was recommended for several uh, positions in the federal government. I mean, because he was a good politician and a good statesperson, mm -hmm. statesman, so. But I did do some work on his book. The Shore Dimly Seen. Yeah. What did you do for that? I just did some research. DeWitt Roberts wrote the book, I guess. I, th I mean, mostly. Okay. You know, <laughs> ghostwriters aren't supposed to say things like that. I know that. it. I'm not supposed to say that. He helped with the book. He did the major research. <laughs> yeah. He did some of the research. We did some of the research, I say. Yeah. I used to face that all the time. People said, who wrote, who wrote his speech? He did. Yeah. Always, he did. And, and I've written speeches for governors that never saw them until they walked out the door with them. Well, I think that the few little speeches I got to write for Thompson, um, his little fireside chat things he did. Do you remember those? Oh, yeah. 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 You know, I always felt sorry for Melvin Thompson because when he served those two years, he really never had a chance. Mm -hmm. The legislature was opposed to him because it had elected Talmadge, mm -hmm. and they were angry because the courts had overturned them. So they didn't give him any money, they, mm -hmm. didn't, they did nothing for him. Yeah. And he sat there for two years, you know, signing executive orders uh, and making civic club speeches. Uh, but he really never had a chance. No. And so that was my big moment in politics in Georgia. <laughs> this was not much of a big moment. So I left and went to Virginia. Well, we all were kind of scattering at the end of that campaign. I tell you, we were all talking about leaving the country. Bill Allen, who had been one of the PR people there, and uh, everybody was talking about leaving. Ed Bridges, I think, was a, uh, one of the reporters' names that worked with us. And, and um, there was some possibility of my going to work with the Atlanta Constitution, and um, I was kind of thinking about that, and um, I'd talked to them about it, and then, but then that whole marriage, going back to graduate school, and, and becoming a college professor, so, but because I was a little bit more of an activist as a college professor, uh, that career. Uh, was fraught with the danger too. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Well, thank Thanks you for so thank you. Thank me. you. That was really good. Thank you.